Weinig landen hebben zo'n hechte band als de Verenigde Staten en Israël. America supports Israel because it's in America's national interest, because we have common values, common goals, common world interests. We've calculated that at the end of the a year ago, as of the end of 2001, we had given the U.S. had given about 91 billion dollars in aid to Israel. Washington geeft per jaar zo'n 3 miljard dollar aan hulp en steunt Israël politiek door dik en dun. We need to make sure that Israel maintains a qualitative military advantage over its opponents. So if you ask them directly, how powerful are you, APEC? They say, oh, we don't have much influence. Wink, wink. We have quite a bit, actually. <laughs> Sit here some, some year during September and plant yourself outside the office of the Anti-Defamation League or the World Jewish Congress or the Conference of Presidents and count the numbers of presidents and kings and prime ministers who come calling. They want to meet the American Jews. Factor. Over de invloed en het belang van de Joodse lobby op de Amerikaanse Midden-Oostenpolitiek. Jews are tremendously socially active in this country. They're engaged. Nine of the 46 Democrats in the Senate, one fifth, are Jewish. As I say, they're two and a half percent of the population. They're 20 percent of the Democrats in the Senate. They're about 20 percent of the senior um, editorial staff at the major newspapers and the major networks. I think the American Jewish community is an influential community because we choose collectively to get deeply involved in the fabric of American intellectual, political, economic, social, academic life. My daughter um, just finished third grade in a Jewish parochial school. Since kindergarten, actually my son just entered kindergarten, they are required to bring a nickel every week for tzedakah, for charity. They learn from the moment they can walk to give money away. So when the Democrats need to raise money, they turn to Jews and they get money. It's, Jews don't have much more money than other Americans. Um, the surveys show that the Jewish median income is slightly higher than the country as a whole. If you remove blacks and Hispanics and only take whites, um, the Jewish economic profile is not much different. But you look at giving patterns, um, both to charity and to politics, and Jews are off the map. Oud diplomaten en senatoren die hun zetels verloren door het toedoen van de lobby, stichten in de jaren 80 het maandblad The Washington Report on Middle Eastern Affairs. Door de jaren heen heeft het blad veel en kritisch geschreven over de wijze waarop APEC, de voornaamste Joodse lobbyorganisatie, te werk gaat. APAC stands for American Israel Public Affairs Committee, whereas a PAC stands for a Political Action Committee, and they're the ones that donate the money. So APAC is a huge organization. It writes a lot of legislation, as I said, and it does lobbying, and it publishes newsletters and information bulletins. And so what happens is that APAC can target or identify congressmen and elected representatives who support the Israel position or who do not support the Israel position. And then all these little PACs will give money accordingly. So while APAC doesn't directly give the money, it in effect organizes and coordinates the contributions of all these smaller PACs. And the problem is that by law, each PAC is allowed to give $5,000 per candidate per election. Well, it, if you have one PAC, say the National Rifle Association PAC, that PAC will give $5,000 to a candidate. Whereas if you have 20 PACs that are all supporting the same cause and the same agenda, if each of them gives $5,000 per candidate, that one candidate can get a lot more money than it can get from the NRA PAC. I have been a donor to and a participant in several pro-Israel PACs. PACs that were created to contribute money to candidates who were willing to say and to support a strong U.S. Israel relationship. But in all the years in which I was involved with PACs, and I've been involved with several, uh, at no time did APAC ever provide any direction or guidance. I mean, clearly they provided, if you asked APAC for, can you tell me about Senator Sarbanes' voting record? 
they would be able to tell us how Senator Sarbanes voted over the last 10 years on every bill that affected the U.S.'s relationship. That's information. That's not direction about who should or who shouldn't get funds. I never saw that happen in my years involved in pro-Israel PACs, that APAC would attempt to direct PACs to do X or Y or Z. Information is what APAC provides, not political direction. APAC has a reputation of being one with whom one does not mess. Um, so it has, it's, it presents, it's perceived, I would say, in a lot of cases, as being invincible. And so I think a lot of Congress people, not only do they want the money that they might get from, from APAC-related organizations, but they don't want the pro-Israel lobby funding their opponents. From the time Israel's created in the Truman administration up through the Reagan administration, there were maybe 70 or 80 major decisions when presidents took one position and the lobby took another position. And when that happens, it's an interesting question. Who wins those kind of debates when there's a real clash between the president of the United States and the lobby? And the answer is the lobby wins 30 percent of the time. Now, is that a lot or is it little? It means the president usually can get his way. It also means that the lobby gets its way 30 percent of the time, even when the president takes a different position. In 1991, right after George Bush I made his famous powerful political forces speech, there was a showdown between the first Bush and Shamir over Israel asking for loan guarantees for Russian resettlement and Bush demanding a halt in settlement construction as a precondition. Um, a group of Jewish organizations, APAC got blamed, but APAC wasn't behind it in this case, mobilized a national, what they called a mobilization. They brought about 1,500 community activists from around the country to Congress one day in September to meet with members of Congress to urge them to override the president and pass the loan guarantees. Um, Bush went on television and attacked them. And nine weeks later, Let's one of famous, a lonely guy in yes, the White House. I'm a lonely little guy all by myself, and I've got about a thousand lobbyists up on the hill. Nine weeks later, his attorney general, uh, running in a special election for senator in Pennsylvania, Dick Thornburg, um, was defeated by somebody that hardly anybody ever heard of, Harris Wofford, who had been 45 points behind in the polls at the beginning of September and ended up winning. He just rose, like he skyrocketed in the polls with a flood of anger money from around the country after the September 11th speech. If voters knew that their congressmen were receiving a lot of money to support Israel, what would they do? What would they think of that? But they don't know it, you know, because they, even if they went to look at their, who their congressmen got money for, and it's, you know, Delaware PAC, what does that say? But if you have a name like Citizens for Good Government or Delaware Valley PAC, you know, who's going to know that this is the organization that's giving you the money, that their agenda is support for Israel? I think if they were straightforward and clear about who they were and what they were doing and why they were doing it, of course, if people wanted to support that, if Americans wanted to support that, it's a free country. That's absolutely the case. But I think it's that, it's that deception and that's why the book that we published called is called Stealth Packs, because it is under, you know, under the radar. This business of unlimited money going to political races has worked out well for Jewish lobbyists. As I say, it's happened on three occasions, in the early 80s, in the early 90s, and this summer, where there were two um, candidates in the South, both of whom were black this time, all of the ones in the past were white so now it's become a racist thing, um, who were brought down by floods of pro-Israel money. If they had to do it every year, they couldn't do it. There aren't that many Jews and there's not that much Jewish money. But as long as they can do it every 10 years or so and get a lot of attention focused on it, which they immediately deny, but everybody gets the message. Um, everybody walks around afraid they're going to be the next. In Atlanta gaan leden van een Joodse vrouwenorganisatie op bezoek bij Denise Majette, de nieuwe vertegenwoordigster van hun district in het Amerikaanse congres. Everybody's take a photograph. Go 
Photograph. Majette is pro-Israëli's en haar campagne is ruimhartig financieel gesteund door Joodse personen en organisaties. Haar voorgangster had afgedaan door kritiek te uiten op Israël. We say very proudly we're a Zionist organization and connected to the land of Israel. Uh, we value the opportunities we have to, to talk to you and, uh, and your colleagues because we understand how valuable the relationship between Israel and the United States is. And uh, it's really important for us to say we're part of the American political process and uh, the things that we really uh, are concerned about are foreign aid to Israel and that we've talked about. You know, we're here to help educate you. You're coming new to a job, and it's an enormous job, a great responsibility, and you're not going to be able to do it well unless you have a lot of information. Um, and we're here to help you gather that information and process it and understand it. All right. Well, thank you. Congresswoman Majete, what's the interest of the U.S. in the, in the so-called special relationship with Israel? Well, I think there are a number of different, a number of different interests. Um, Certainly, there's an economic interest, and there's uh, there's that that the historical uh, ties and relationship, the common bond that we share uh, as being uh, democracies. Uh, the it's a it's a difficult. I, if obviously, I don't have the answers to all the questions. Amnesty International published two reports lately, declaring suicide bombing as a crime against humanity, and accusing the Israeli army of committing war crimes in the territories. Can you comment on it? Well, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not familiar. Yeah, I'm not familiar. With, okay. I'm familiar with Amnesty International, but the, the two studies that you just quoted, I'm not, I'm not familiar with the. Um, are you familiar with the casualty numbers of this intifada among Israelis and Palestinians? Not the, no, not the total numbers. is the Jewish lobby in, in America? This is something about which Europeans are obsessed as a rule, this Jewish lobby. The views that we express gain uh, support not because there's a, quote, lobby, but because it reflects the views of the American people. The overwhelming majority of the American people support a strong U.S.-Israel relationship. They understand that this is the sole democracy in the region. They understand who wants peace and who has been the, the source of the conflict and of the terrorism and of the violence. And people here who get a much fairer view from the press than generally Europeans do have a more balanced view of, of the realities in the region and support it for those reasons. They identify with Israel. They see that they have the same morals and values and norms and justice, commitments to democracy and freedom. He speaks in the name of the Jewish organizational world. Um, there are about 300 national Jewish organizations in America and thousands of local ones. There are probably 5,000 synagogues. Um, there is a, a network of Jewish charity that raises and spends altogether between four and eight billion dollars a year. <clears throat> and the person who represents that network to the administration on foreign affairs issues is Malcolm Holman. He rides on top of a very um, frisky horse, and he keeps his various troops in line, roughly. Um, he's on the phone with the State Department several times an hour. Nobody issues a new statement on the Middle East or drafts a new bill on the Middle East for Congress without clearing it with the Malcolm Holm line because he can mobilize Jewish volunteers to protest and he can suppress protest if he feels it's important to keep it quiet. Because he is the coordinator of the Conference of Presidents of Jewish Organizations. In the first years of Israel's existence, the first 20 years, the United States did not send arms to Israel. We sent some economic aid, but we didn't send military aid. So there was a kind of standoffishness. Yes, we have this commitment, we have this relationship, there's a history, you know, it's a democratic country, uh, we want it to survive, but we also have these other interests in the region. We have to try to 
cultivate those at the same time. So we need to be a little bit balanced. 67 is a turning point because Israel demonstrates that it's a powerful country as well. And so Israel emerges not only as powerful, but friendly, democratic. With the Johnson period, you begin to get the tilt toward, let's put our, our bets on Israel as a strong friend in the region, and maybe there will be some strategic benefits. And Nixon and Kissinger pick that up and develop it as a, a kind of rationale that by, by keeping Israel strong, you somehow will humiliate the Soviet Union. They, they didn't care about the Middle East per se. They cared about the great competition with, with the Soviet Union. And Israel was, by 1970, seen as a kind of strategic asset with which you could discredit pro-Soviet regimes. In Philadelphia wordt de jaarlijkse bijeenkomst georganiseerd van plaatselijke Amerikaans-Joodse organisaties. Rond deze General Assembly vinden tal van lezingen, workshops en andere activiteiten plaats. Toplobbyist Honline neemt deel aan een bijeenkomst over Hasbara. Dit Hebreeuwse woord betekent letterlijk uitleg of informatie. Maar hier kan het beter worden vertaald als propaganda. Israel's case and to compete with uh, a lot of the misinformation, the distortions and misrepresentations in the American media. But we have a frontier which is the battle for the hearts and minds of the American people. And we have some remarkable spokesmen for Israel, and I think Mark ranks at the very top. The spokesman of the Embassy of Israel, Mark Reagan. I want to talk very briefly about two things that we're talking about, Hasbara. One is message, and the other one is tactics. Message. I think it's crucially important that Israelis, that pro-Israelis, that American Jews, that Canadian Jews, that we refuse to accept the parameters of the debate that are shaped by the opposition. I think it's very important that we shape the parameters of the debate. For Hamas, for Islamic Jihad, for Hezbollah, my one-year-old, Mark Reagan's one-year-old, is a legitimate target. And that's the truth. I don't say so. They say so. We see them on cable television. We see them on network television. We hear them on the radio. We saw them after the terrible massacre on Passover. They get up there and they say, we did this. We killed those people in the hotel in Netanya. We did it. We're proud of it. And we're going to continue doing it. There is no moral neutrality. One side makes a maximum effort to avoid hurting innocent civilians, and the other side does it as a deliberate strategy. Well, if I could give advice to anyone in this room, I would say reject those parameters. It's simply not true. And when everyone talks, when anyone talks about cycle of violence, you've got to stand up and you've got to say that it is a twisting of the reality. There is no cycle of violence. And it's important that we say that. We, it's important that we say it again and again in our message. The Anti-Defamation League have a rather leaky office in Boston. Once uh, someone uh, leaked to me my file. Your file? Yeah, 150 pages, just like an FBI file. It was being leaked to me because it was be had on the front of it a name, namely Alan Dershowitz. It was being sent to Alan Dershowitz uh, to prepare him for a debate that he and I were going to have in a couple of days. So they were providing him with defamatory material that they had cooked up somewhere, you know, and like an FBI file, mostly fabrications or one thing or another. Uh, but, but the idea is to prevent discussion by diverting it into the sins of the person, you know, why do you support PLO terror or whatever it may be. And then you argue about that and you don't talk about the topic. Terug naar de vragen waarmee we begonnen over de macht en invloed van de lobby op de Amerikaanse Midden-Oosten politiek. APEC kan veel, weten we nu. Het kan in een aantal gevallen zelfs presidenten dwingen tegen hun zin te handelen. Maar wat is het uiteindelijke doel? 
Hoe lang zal de lobby doorgaan Israël te steunen als dat land blijft weigeren de compromissen te sluiten die nodig zijn voor een vredesregeling? APAC has always to this point supported the democratically elected government of Israel. The Israeli people have spoken and have elected a prime minister and the prime minister has been able to form a government. That government's policies are ones that APAC has since I've been involved with APAC supported and worked hard to strengthen. Its instinct is to support Israeli policy regardless of what happens. Israelis and Europeans see that as support for hawkishness, but it's not. It's support for Israel having the right to do whatever it wants. America should support Israel regardless of what Israel decides. You may not think that's a good way for a person to operate in politics. That's the decision they reached. They're there to defend Israel's right to do whatever it wants. Israelis and Palestinians are both dying, are all dying because of the occupation. I, I think that's killing everybody. And, that, <laughs> and the U.S. is paying for it, you know, so it's like, it has to stop. I think even quite hard-headed Americans who have no special sympathy for Israel would say that Israel needs to have a military capability to defend itself, and they can't afford the arms that we offer, so we have to provide some means for them to acquire the arms if we want them to not rely on nuclear weapons as their main defense, and we don't. We'd rather have them keep the bomb in the basement, and the price for doing that is to make sure that they have an alternative. And that's a very special American security relationship that doesn't have to be nurtured too much with uh, APAC pressure. The military likes the relationship, the arms manufacturers like the relationship. So that it's a very complex system of mutual interests and deal-making that this whole thing rests on. Yeah. Um, Sounds like horse trading. It is. It's horse trading. It's, it's a system in which the Jewish community is a player. Um, people standing on the outside who begin with the assumption there's something wrong with this because Israel's evil and Jews are evil. And therefore, there must be something funny going on. There's nothing funny going on. Just huge amounts of money. Huge amounts of money, which is how America works. <laughs>